Th thank you very much. Thanks for uh, for coming. Uh, this will be sort of a non-commercial talk. It's a principles of vaccination rather than dealing with specific vaccines. Although um, after attending this morning's talk, I wanted to just review some of the information that was pre prevented, presented uh, this morning. Um, and this is more about how you use vaccines and who you give them to, and uh, rather than which particular vaccine you, uh, that you use. Um, vaccines are unique, I guess, in the way we deal with animals in that uh, vaccines are the only things that we, that we do on a routine basis, maybe other than deworming where we expect to see nothing at all after we use them and which makes it difficult to figure out whether they're actually working or not. But if you think about that, if you see nothing at all, I want to vaccinate an animal, I don't want it to, to have a lump or a swelling at the vaccination site, I don't want it to be uh, droop-eared the next day, uh, so I don't want the vaccine to, to cause some sort of problem for it. And then if the vaccine works perfectly, I don't want to see that it gets sick either. And so what happens though, um, is that it then becomes difficult for you to judge whether the vaccine program had, had worked at all. When we do feedlot research, and we're not the only ones that, that, that do it, but, uh, but others do, one of the things that we look for vaccines as well is we, in order to figure out whether they're really providing a benefit, we look for uh, whether it influences rate of gain or whether it influences carcass uh, quality or feed conversion, but we usually have to do several thousand animals in order to detect that benefit. And that's a little bit of the payback of, of vaccination. But in most cases, we vaccinate with the hope that we see nothing at all, which makes it a little bit challenging to figure out whether you're doing the right thing or not. Uh, when you see nothing, there's always the lingering question, did I have to use it at all? Did, did, was the disease not there? And so, you know, I didn't need the vaccine. Uh, or uh, was the, the vaccine so efficacious that I never saw something? I provide advice to veterinarians, usually sometimes to, to ranchers to, and to farmers, and they ask me, you know, I'm using this vaccine that contains multiple things. Do I really have to use it? Because I haven't seen any sickness in, a, in quite a long time, and the challenge is, well, that's a difficult question to answer unless you start, start looking to see what's exactly going on in the particular herd. Uh, so it makes it difficult, difficult to judge for sure. So then we get asked commonly, and this, this visit for me to Alberta has been one where I've been asked almost every time I go into a veterinary clinic, what is the best sort of program to use to vaccinate baby calves or to vaccinate calves at spring processing time? Um, and what's the research to show that that's the best program? And the nature of, of the risk of disease, particularly risk of disease for pneumonia means that that particular group that those, those baby calves is the most difficult group of calves to actually figure out whether the vaccines work. Uh, when I do a feedlot trial or I'm involved in a feedlot trial, we would routinely enroll somewhere between two and 3,000 feedlot calves in order to find out. And the pull rates in feedlot calves, I hope, are way higher than on any ranch in, in, in Alberta uh, or in, in Canada in total. And so it becomes very difficult to do that sort of research. What that means, and you're a victim of it right now, is that a lot of the recommendations are based on experts' opinions rather than actual field trials to determine whether the vaccines work or not. It's a little bit clearer in using vaccines on cows. We can actually run trials, kind of real world trials, which is, and that's what I want to review a little this morning from the earlier talk, the, some of the real world research that, that's out there. So we can, we have a better insight in whether vaccination programs for cows, A, whether they matter, and B, whether they work than we have for baby calves. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what we, we know about baby calves and what we don't know about vaccinating baby calves. So, the, the, co the real complication, and, and uh, uh, it was discussed in the first session this morning, is some diseases that are important, particularly for, for people who sell seed stock, that are selling genetics, the diseases can be very silent to the point where you could sell a problem on to somebody else, and you would never know, but the person who 
realized that we'll, we'll really know. And uh, as Tammy's aware, I often get calls in Ontario. There's a, there's a uh, farm in Ontario that sells seed stock. And twice in the time that I have been uh, in Ontario, they sold a heifer carrying a persistently infected calf to somebody. And that calf was born and it caused a bit of a wreck in the herd where it was born in. And the person who sold that calf, that, that bred heifer, they had no idea they were selling a heifer that was, so I go back, I got involved because I'm supposed to be an unbiased third party. And so I go, go in and sit down with the farmer and we go through, how could this have happened? You know, what, what, what might it contribute to, to it happening? But I, I see that, I, I, I do see that people, because BVD is so insidious, you sell animals on, you don't even realize that you've done it and it, it shows up. And unless the people are very good at, at tracking, they may not realize exactly where it came from either, depending on how many acquisitions they had in the last, in the last little while. Uh, I was talking to some people within Boringer this morning. Just recently, Ireland decided they were going to eradicate BVD. And so that's a, that's a philosophy that some countries just adopt. And the way Ireland did it is we're going to test every darn cattle beast in Ireland in a very short period of time. And the, the technology is out there. The most difficult thing is the getting, the getting the samples from the actual cattle. And so they tested all the dairy cattle, all the beef cattle in Ireland in a very short period of time. What they found, because they shared the information they found, was very, very helpful because it, it gives us an idea of probably what it looks like here, because they're not the only ones who have done it this way. Other countries have done it this way and, and found pretty much the same sort of stuff. BVD is insidious, but 30% of herds in Ireland had at least one BVD carrier. Almost all of them had only one carrier and it didn't matter how big the herd was. And so if you've got 200 cows, it still was likely you only had one carrier. If you had 40 cows, you could understand you might only have one carrier. So that was kind of interesting. And the most devastating thing for me was almost all of them bought it. And they bought it in a, by purchasing a pregnant cow or heifer. And the, the, the calf that was inside was a persistently infected calf. So for me, when it says BVD free, it means you don't have to pay extra. It doesn't mean that, because there's no way to test that calf that's yet been born. And so BVD free is a, is a bit of a challenge. It, it really does mean you don't have to pay extra for it. So BVD is insidious. Okay, some diseases are difficult to control with vaccines alone, and I'll so, kind of show you a little bit why. So, uh, but because that's true, because we can't completely control pneumonia with vaccination, then people start, well, maybe we need better vaccines, or maybe we need to use them in a, in a different way. So you be kind of lo lose faith, and then you become vulnerable to expert opinion. But as long as you realize that all you're do doing is accepting expert opinion rather maybe than true field work, or field research, then maybe you'd be, you'd be uh, well off. So uh, the other complicating factor, and this one has been the, the story of my professional life, is boy, it's way too much work to do it that way. I want to do it the way I want to do it. And, and, and what do you mean it, it, it's not likely to work? And, and so the convenient to use. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I, I had to go to uh, South Africa. And so I was told by my physician, I had, need to get these four vaccinations, right? No, man, you don't understand, Jennifer. I, I got to get on a plane in a month, right? And so I'll just wait. I'll, I'll get the vaccinations after I get back. How's that? And, uh, and you know, I mean, it's ridiculous, right? But uh, we sometimes vaccinate far away from when the actual benefit or, or the... the um, uh, the uh, common sense is uh, to use the vaccine. So anyway, so here we go. I have this sort of balance bar that, ca that cost is always somewhat king for sure, uh, but what we really want to do is to protect the cattle and it should, it, this little word over here that's probably projected on the wall is best. So best protection for the cattle and then easiest for me, it's so somewhere in, in between is this balancing act that we're gonna have to accomplish. I think if you understand some of the limitations of the 
of biology, you might be more tempted to use them in a manner that provides best protection rather than easiest. Maybe it'll be easier as, w as well, but still it'll, it won't be necessarily easiest. So anyway, so w what matters to best protection? Almost always what matters to best protection is when you vaccinate. Of all the, the, the changes or the, that you might make in your, in your program, when you vaccinate is probably the most important because some diseases are either seasonally in a, seasonal in occurrence or related to some other life event uh, in animals that, that are cr pretty critical. Uh, so the one situation is that timing really matters is if you're going to vaccinate the cows, and I'm pretty brutal about this, if you come to me with, the, with a vaccination protocol that is barking mad, I'm just as likely to tell you I wish you wouldn't use our vaccine if you're going to do that because I, I'm pretty certain it's not going to work. And, but go ahead, I'm not going to stop you. Just buy someone else's vaccine if you don't mind and uh, because that, that is a, a, a real problem. problem. We see that with cows probably more than any other group because it's not only uh, to protect them, to keep them pregnant, it's to protect the calves that they're going to deliver as well. Because scour vaccines, unless they're uh, administered at just the right time, are unlikely to provide any benefit at all. So all you do, is, I call that the piss off the cow vaccination program, and because uh, that's, that's pretty much going to be the outcome. That's not going to be very helpful. Okay, so does it really, it, it's unfortunate that it's lying terribly well, uh, but anyway. Uh, does it really matter when you're planning to vaccinate breeding age cow, cows? Yes, it does, and I'm gonna try to walk you through. And it, it's these limitations uh, that are the issue. To try to figure out the best time, you need to know how long the vaccine will protect, and increasingly that's put right on the label of the vaccine, so that's kind of good. Uh, you need to know uh, about how, what happens to that calf before it's born at the, the various phases of gestation, and then how the industry works, because it's no matter how I might rant about you know, it's not always going to be convenience. Yeah, if you're not handling them, you know, no matter how much I rent, you won't be vaccinating them at, at that time. So how the industry works and then determine a vaccination window the best time rather than one pr particular date that you're going to do it. So anyway, this is what it's based on. So usually when I'm vaccinating or recommending vaccinating cows, it pivots around BVD uh, because of the the diseases that could affect the onborn calf, BVD is probably the most important to a, to a seed stock provider because you run the risk of passing your problems along to somebody else, creating a SEP, somebody else's problem, and, uh, and so you just kind of pass that along. To understand how BVD works, then this, this, it's, it's good to sort of at least look at this graph. So what this is intended to be, these are the consequences of a fetus becoming infected, and this is when during pregnancy the infection occurs. So one that's really kind of important, and we see that, and this would be if you pull the bulls and you got a lot of open cows in the fall, yeah, maybe they were pregnant, but they're not pregnant now because BVD took out the fetus in that first six to eight to 10 weeks of, of its life. And then this other one that's circled here, it's called immunotolerance. Um, and it's called immunotolerance because if the BVD virus affects the calf, the onborn calf, before its immune system develops, then the BVD virus is never seen as anything unusual. It's just another part of the calf. And so its immune system is tolerant of the fact that the BVD virus is there. And then it gets other weird and wonderful things. You can get abnormal calves, et cetera, et cetera. But these, are, to me, are the two big ones, because if they're open in the fall, that's very expensive. And if, you, if you're selling a problem onto somebody else, that's not great for your reputation. So why are persistently infected calves so important? Because they keep virus in the cattle population. How countries eradicate BVD is they identify and remove the persistently infected calves, and it's been proven time and time again. If you do that, then you will eradicate BVD because it doesn't arrive on birds and streams and so on and so forth. It arrives on cattle. In North America, we always wonder whether it arrives on bison, elk, or you know, mule deer, or red-tailed deer, or white-tailed deer as well. But so far, they haven't shown that they're, they're big issues for us. Um, 
if you spread it to pregnant cows, um, then you may not know you get it until the last calf is born. So if you're sending animals to shared pastures, for example, or the neighbor's bull jumps over your fence, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, then it can get, get around for sure. Uh, and then they get sold, and it becomes somebody else's problem. Uh, keeping the numbers of PIs to a minimum is, is really a goal. And it doesn't require too much sort of change in what you're doing if you're already vaccinating. So anyway, it's become very common about six, eight years ago now, uh, at least two vaccines came onto the market that said we protect against BVD and IBR for a year. And people interpreted that me to mean that it doesn't really matter when I vaccinate anymore because it protects for a year. And to a certain extent, that's true in dairy because they're, in dairy, they're very much more regimented about make sure, making sure that they vaccinate at least annually. Whereas in beef, what it meant was a lot of people went to preg check time vaccination and preg check time is kind of a random act of violence when it occurs because it's depend on, dependent on weather. Uh, it's dependent on what else you're doing. It depends on when you can get the vet, it, you know, all these things. So it could be months different from, from year to year. And so you really do get kind of vulnerable to, to having big windows when cows are not actually protected with the vaccine. So I, I like to people to walk through what we're trying to accomplish with vaccination. So maybe it, it sort of sticks in your mind that, oh yeah, it is important when I, when I vaccinate. So here we go. Uh, so if you, at this dot, uh, this is the, you throw out a bull or you synchronize an AI or whatever, uh, then they'll get pregnant. That takes, the, if, you're, if you're good, 40 days. If you're not lucky, maybe 60 days, uh, but that's, that's that period. Then from this graph here, we know that this time when persistently infected animals are formed goes up to about the first five months of pregnancy. And so that's where this 150 days comes, roughly. Uh, I like rounding. I'm not particularly good at I like rounding everything except what I spend. Uh, so, so I like rounding on days anyway. And so, so roughly 150 days. So then we can calculate with this, uh, one says if it takes 40 to 60 days for them to get bred after you put out the bull or you start to start to AI them, then you need 150 days, then you need something like 190 to 210 days of protection from the vaccine in order to be confident that your calves will be, or that your onborn calves will be as, as well protected as possible. So that's fine. Hmm. It's really getting uh, shifted. So that's the reality of the biology of BVD and how cows work. And so how do vaccines work? Well, if, you, if you're really good at reading the labels, you can find that there are four vaccines that you can buy in Canada that kind of tells you how long they protect the fetus. So one of them says, we'll do it for 120 days. So you better get on it if you're trying to cover it for 150 because 120 doesn't do it already, right? Because 120 is less than 150. Uh, and, and then you've got this one that says, well, we do it for 206 days. I would suggest if you need 190 to 210, you get on it pretty much now too. You know, the same day you turn out the bull, you're going to have to be vaccinating them with that. And then there's two out here that one says it's got 365, one says it's got it's got 370. Okay, well maybe that's useful because I'm busy today, and uh, and uh, so I turned out. I'm going. I want to turn out the bull, but I'm kind of busy. I don't want to vaccinate him or whatever. So that 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 determines pretty much what you're going to use, really, if you really want to protect and and determine when you're going to vaccinate as well. Uh, so if we say that we needed this 190 to 210, and our tools, the best tools we have would give us somewhere between 360 and 370, then we've got this window of something like 175 to 180 days, because that's just take 370, take 
210 away from 370, and this is sort of the, the time frame. So if you know when you're going to turn out the bull, which is usually pretty much a fixed date, everybody knows today when they're going to turn out the bull, probably next year, uh, then your window to vaccinate to protect against BBD is this six months before you turn out the bull. If you're vaccinating anything other than that six month window, you're unlikely to provide the protection. So that's if you pivoted your vaccination program around BVD. So if you decide that this guy, now that cannabis is legal, has been smoking way too much and is, you know, is, is not really in this world for any great quantity of time, then you should, we need to look at the other sort of things that we're trying to protect against. And so in a five-way vaccine, there, are, there is, is at least one other disease that we want to protect the unborn calf against, and that's IBR virus. In a 10 or 11 way, so a, so a five way plus the five leptos, maybe plus Vibrio, there's a couple of more because the leptos and the Vibrios are, cause a risk to the fetus as well. So let's look at those. Well, if we do the same exercise with IBR, IBR virus is a little bit different because if BVD is really sort of annoying in the first 150 days, IBR is annoying for the entire gestation. And so you're going to need the 280 or 290 days worth of protection, which means you're probably better get on it now too, as well if you want to protect against IBR. And then you get into the other components of that vaccine. So the five leptos, this is a little bit dodgy because none of the leptos claim that they will protect against abortion, but most of them now have been tested that to show that they protect against something that's close enough to abortion that they likely work. It's just that none of them say how long they will do that. So then the closer, if you're worried about these diseases, the closer you, you vaccinate them to the time that you're going to turn out the bull, probably the more likely you're going to get the protection. And that's the same with Vibrio as well. So in the, the Vibrio or Campylobacter is the real name of it. Um, they, no one knows how long the protection lasts, so the closer that you use a Vibrio vaccine to the time the bull goes out, probably, probably to the, the better. So that's kind of the rational approach to, to, uh, to administering vaccines to cows. And in my opinion, if you don't kind of follow that, then you have to make some other commitments. You can always make things work, but you just have to understand what the limitations are so you adjust your behavior to overcome the limitations. And the adjustments that you'd have to make would be that I'm going to commit, that I'm, that I'm always going to preg check in this sort of four-week window. So then every year, at least I'm going to give cows a, 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 their booster vaccination or their first vaccination if they're replacements in a win the same window every year. And that's reasonably typically what the dairy farmers do. They say, yeah, we're going to vaccinate this time every year. You could do that too. That would be an alternative to vaccinate them just before you turn them out. That still is a bit of a problem because you know, you've, do, you've solved IBR and solved BVD, but you may not have solved lepto, you may not have sol, sol, solved Vibrio. So you've got to think about that. That's the other way. The other way that, that the only way you can make that work is that you've got to choose those two vaccines that say they last for about a year. Because a vaccine that lasts for 210 days or 207 days ain't going to do it for you. Because if you use at preg check time the vaccine that lasts 207 days, by the time you turn out the bull in June, you're hooped, right? Or you know, it, so it, it is. It is a bit of a problem for sure. Okay. So then you get. If you do the preg check time or any other time other than pre-breeding, you don't get the best protection. But it's easiest. That's king. But you spend the same amount for the vaccine, so I'm not convinced it's the best choice. And then you can adjust it. If you realize for BVD you got a six-month window, you might identify some times where you're going to handle those cattle already, and that's when you'd, that's when you'd arrange to, to, vac to vaccinate them. So it's not necessarily the best that you could do, uh, but it's a little bit easier. Uh, now this was uh, this was presented this morning. Anyone who is in the first the first talk at eight o'clock this morning, I just want to revisit it uh, because I, I I want you to understand what happened with these with with the data in this table. And what this is is this is just a summary of four different research trials using different vaccines, and and we've named names here. So all all of the vaccines except one on this table would have.
tested by the American government to see whether they actually protect the onborn calf. But with that test that the American government does, it's not really very close to what happens in the real world. And so people were concerned, what happens in the real world, the vaccines may not work at all or may not work very well. So, so there was a group in Auburn, Alabama at the vet school there that decided, well, we'll do the real world thing. The difference between how the government requires it and the real world is the government requires that you take a whole bunch of BVD virus and you squirt it once up a pregnant cow's nose. It's an exciting time because they usually exhale at just the wrong time. And so you have to put it deep in. But what happens in the real world is you get cows out for the summer with a persistently infected calf. And then some persistently infected calves are more social than others. And some cows are more social than others. So you get this prolonged exposure, but it's episodic. So does it really work in the real world? So these guys, to their credit, well, guys and gals, actually, um, they decided, well, let's do this. We'll vaccinate a bunch of cows, we'll breed them up, and, and we'll create persistently infected calves, and we'll give them each, each persistently infected calf will have a BBD virus that we know. So we can go back later and find out if we get any of these persistently infected fetuses, we'll know which calf was the gregarious one, which, which one likes to watch the soaps in the afternoon with the girls. And, and it, it was, there were differences in, in behavior, it was kind of fun. So at the start, they tested uh, Boba Shield, you probably all heard of it, Pyramid, Virus Shield, which is an inactivated vaccine. They threw them out with three PI calves, persistently infected calves, for about two months, which is, it could be real world, for sure. And what happened was, the, the modified live, Pyramid and Boba Shield, they got no infected calves. So the vaccines worked, in other words, because the unvaccinated ones, every last one of the unvaccinated cows gave birth to a carrier calf. So it was pretty good. They had gregarious, persistently infected calves. Virus Shield, four doses of Virus Shield, they still had persistently infected calves born when they used Virus Shield. Okay, so when we saw that, we, we sell Express, we go running down, Dan, Dan, tr try it with Express. And so he did that, and Express was more or less the same thing. So of the 19 calves and cows that were vaccinated with Express, there were no carrier calves, there were 10 out of 10 again, so it's a really good system. It's a really good system. For me, because I like to be a student of both human and cattle behavior, it was fun to see whether one persistently infected calf spread the joy uh, to all, all, the, all the cows and so on and so forth. But if anybody wants that, I'm more than happy to share it, but um, I won't do it right now. So then there was an, uh, this, this study was done at actually Michigan State, so a little bit further north, where they gave bova shield either in the, muscular, in the muscle or under the skin, and then they threw them out with six persistently infected cattle, but only for one day. So it wasn't quite the same for sure, but still, you know, they got pretty good success. Three out of 20 were carrier calves, three out of 20 were carrier calves. All of the unvaccinated ones were carrier calves. And in the last study, another inactivated vaccine, this is Cattle Master. It's kind of looks like a live, but it, it really acts like a, an, an inactivated vaccine. They gave them two doses. They put four persistently infected calves for, for a little bit more than three months, and it protected about 75 percent of, of those cows. So the, the killed ones may not do such a, such a thorough job as the modified live ones. But I just wanted to revisit that because that was presented uh, this morning. It's the only real world re research studies that we have. There's all sorts of research studies that are kind of done in the lab. But the take home message for me is the vaccines work pretty darn well, but every last one of these animals, if they were vaccinated, were vaccinated in the last, in the six weeks or so before they went out with the bull. And so, so it, it needs to be quite timely as well. Uh, if you're talking about cows, I think it's important to realize, particularly if you saw, are somebody who sells bulls, that BVD acts in bulls an even wilder way in that, so if I expose a bull to BVD virus and it's not protected, from the infection, the BVD virus ends up in its testicles. And I can go back and biopsy its testicles and it'll be there six months later in its testicles. By that time, it's built a cottage by a seminiferous tubule and it's just sort of 
sits out at night with a beer and, and watches the semen go by. And, and it stays there for a long period of time. This is a big damn deal in, in AI units, right? That they want to be sure that the bulls do not have BVD because they don't have it anywhere else in their body. They just have it in their testicles. From a practical uh, standpoint, if you're buying bulls or selling bulls, that bulls should be vaccinated against BVD before they go through puberty. We think the ability of the BVD virus to survive in the testicles is due to the fact that at puberty, essentially the semen producing parts of the testicles get separated from the bull. Get, there, it builds a barrier so that the immune system of the bull does not go after the semen. And, but if the BVD virus is in there with the semen, it's there forever too, essentially, we think. So bulls should be in the vaccination program. And then here we come to the, one of the great challenges, how do you vaccinate calves? Because that's the other thing, if you're a cow-calf person, let cover the calves, cows rather, cover the bulls. Well, now we're into the calf sort of, and this is tough because we're, we see in the US, if, if I speak to US veterinarians, they have a name for this now, it's called summer pneumonia or pasture pneumonia. People are not really sure whether we've ever seen it before, but it certainly has become more common in the last decade, decade and a half. And it clusters on ranches, and in Ontario it clusters on farms. So some farms see none, and some farms see lots. Uh, on Monday I was looking at a, a research paper that was just published in the United States um, and uh, from North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, looking at ranches, and they were looking at ranches that had problem with summer pneumonia. They were treating 20% of calves. And these were large ranches. These were four to 600 cows. And so these were large ranches treating 20% of calves. Talk about, it's got long day written all over it, right? You're out there with a quad, et cetera, et cetera. Time to buy a drone, I'd say, if you're treating that many. It saves a lot of steps, for sure. So this is a problem. It's not terribly well understood. It was, uh, it was interesting to see that study because it was large herds. They were running different management groups of cows. And so rotational pasture is a risk factor. And they think it's a risk factor because you get isolation. You don't get thing, the germs spread around so much uh, on, on a ranch so that everybody's exposed. So you get these groups of calves, cows and and mums that don't see a virus, and then all of a sudden they see it, and they see pasture pneumonias, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know if that's true or not, but it may be. So pneumonia, pasture pneumonia is a problem, and this graph illustrates sort of how this works for calves as far as immunity is concerned. So when a calf gets first milk from its mother, it gets immunity in the first milk. But the first milk does not protect equally against all diseases. So for scours, for example, first milk generally protects for about 10 to 14 days. After that first milk, there's still antibody in the cow, but she's not providing it to the calf in a, in a meaningful way that protects the calf. With pneumonia, which is the kind of the next thing that's lost, is the protection goes away somewhere between four weeks and six to seven weeks which in dairy, that's when we wean them. And in beef, that's often when we process them. And so they're very, very vulnerable at that time because the protection from pneumonia that they got from their mum is kind of vanishing. And it's up to them now to provide their own protection. And this is equally tragic because this is whether they're susceptible, susceptible to becoming sick the antibody that's in the blood may even block the vaccination. So it's a very vulnerable time for them. And you have to factor that, factor that into the system as well. So this goes back to, uh, to the causes of pneumonia and what's in vaccines and what causes pneumonia in cattle. So if you were here for the talk previously, genomics has more or less, or if it hasn't now, it will res revolutionize how you select uh, sires, how you select replacements. Genomics has, is revolutionizing diagnostics because it's still kind of a research tool, but we can take a swab from the nose of a cow and we can test every damn bit of DNA and RNA in that swab. And so Edward Timpsett at 
Calgary, that's what he did with feedlot calves. So he came up with a whole new addition to these lists, but let's sort of look at what this means. So the blue ones are things you can buy vaccines against. So BRSV virus, you've heard of it probably, PI3, BVD, IBR, Histophilus is a bacterium, Mannheim is a bacterium, Pasteurella bacterium. But then you've got these additional viruses that we know cause pneumonia in calves. There's bovine respiratory coronavirus. We've known that for a while. This is a different coronavirus from the one that causes the squirts. It is not the same virus. And, and so then there's influenza D, which we've known about for a little while as well. But Dr. Chimpsett, he found that more often in feedlot calves that had pneumonia. He also found that there were three different bovine rhinitis viruses that are linked to pneumonia in feedlot calves as well. Rhinitis viruses are in the same general family that cause colds in people. And so that, that's kind of cool. There are rhinitis viruses that cause the snots in horses too. And uh, so it's, it is a, a bit of a problem. And then we've got some other bacteria out here that, that we don't have vaccines for. We've got Arcanobacter, which has been renamed four times since I've been a veterinarian. So you probably heard of it, you just don't recognize it. And so that's its newest name. You might have seen it, Carinibacterium. It's been, or it's been Actinomyces at one time. It's just had a wonderful set of names. It's really in the therapy now because of its identity crisis, to tell you the truth. But, and then we've got Salmonella Dublin. And I want to put this in here. This is primarily a problem in dairy calves, but it is a disease you do not want to buy. And so Salmonella Dublin, it principally observed as pneumonia in dairy calves. That's its, that's its most common sort of clinical feature. But you could bring in a dairy calf, you could bring in crypto, you could bring in a hairy heel warts, you could bring in Salmonella Dublin, and those are all free too. There's no additional charge whatsoever for those. So if you, if, and with crypto and with Salmonella Dublin, if you bought dairy colostrum, you would be equally at risk of doing that. So don't do that would be my advice. There's no negotiation. If you want colostrum, I would buy you know, the powdered colostrum from Saskatoon Colostrum Company. But the dairy, as much as it's nice to have a dairy farm next door, they're not a place to provide stuff to your, to your, uh, to your beef herd, for sure. Uh, mycoplasma causes pneumonia. There's a whole bunch of those guys. And then why would you settle for one when you could have a whole darn bunch? You know, that makes sense as well. So then, OK. Uh, that is the problem. So we cover roughly with the vaccines about 50% of the things that we know cause pneumonia. So it's going to be an imperfect system. Anytime there's an imperfect system, people start to look for solutions. Can I vaccinate better using the current tools in an imperfect system? Because the system is imperfect because we're vaccinating very young animals that may not respond the same as adults to the vaccines. And we know we don't cover all the bugs with the vaccines. So then if we give vaccines in different ways, will we get better protection? When I first graduated back in the 80s, we only had intranasal vaccines. So intranasal vaccines appear to be new, but they're not really new. But now we see inter intranasal vaccines, and it's the newest kind of talking point. And they may be beneficial. The evidence that we have so far is if they are, the protection doesn't last terribly long. That, that they, they, they may provide good protection, but it doesn't last terribly long. So we have to work out a plan how to use them. It's a little like cow vaccines. If you know how to use them, maybe you can accomplish your goals. If you're not using them within their limitations, maybe not so much. But will different vaccines give better protection? Maybe so. The things that have been talked about are if you give intranasal only, and you could do that in a couple of ways that I see in beef. In, in dairy, it's pretty typical when they're born, they would give them an intranasal. And, and in beef, I see it kind of two ways. Some people are giving at birth, and then there's a bunch that are giving it at spring processing time, whenever that might be. At birth is kind of interesting because the calves, I would argue, are pretty much the same age, right? But at processing time, every time I've been out here, those calves at processing time, some of them will be two weeks old, some of them will be four, some of them will be six, some of them will be eight. And, and from that graph that I showed you, you know, those calves are very different because their immune system is very different because of, of the rate of protection they got from their mom going away. So when you, if you vaccinate with, with those vaccines, any vaccine really at spring processing time, some calves might be well protected, others might not be just because 
you're confronted with, I'm not going to vaccinate every calf the second it hits six weeks of age. I've got to vaccinate them like this now. So you've got to factor in that there's a little bit of wobble associated just with the biology of, of the calves being a different age at spring processing. Um, we've seen, okay, I'm going to give them intranasal and then I'm going to give them some other vaccine that there's not a lot of science that you're really into the expert opinion in, in there. Uh, you're going to alternate killed vaccines and live vaccines. Now, this would be in the cows, right? So if I vaccinate her with a live vaccine, I'm going to boost her with a killed vaccine later. The science in that is rather limited. Um, and the, even the science that is available that's done sort of at the same sort of time frame. So I used the killed and I didn't use, or sorry, I used the live and I didn't use the killed until about a year later. No one has looked to see what happens if I did that year after year, that I never went back and gave a kill. So that's kind of, again, you're in the expert opinion realm rather than having it based on science. So that, that is a bit, bit of a problem. Um, there, no, there are not many different vaccines that have been tested to be used together, the regulators. So the regulators have, can make comments. And I only know of two that, are, that are, have been tested and officially approved to be used together. And it's, though, neither of them are the vaccines that we use in baby calves. Okay. Um, and then we've got, because it's an imperfect system, we're trying to get around the natural biology of the calf and the limitations of the vaccines. Then you get a whole bunch of people doing some ill-advised things. Let's just say there's, I saw somebody in the prairies two years ago saying you take a vaccine that's intended to be given in the muscle and you squirt it up the nose of the calf. Let me know how that works out for you. And, and th the reason is it may very well work, but it may not be safe. So any vaccine that's approved to be used in a proper manner has been tested not only for effectiveness, it's been tested for safety. So the further you get away from what you're using on the, what the label says, the more you're into ground that, that may not really be safe for the animal. And that's combined with that. A lot of the research, do they, they don't generally follow up in the same time frame. So they might vaccinate in an experimental way and then come back with the disease like three weeks later. Yeah, it doesn't tell you a great deal about what it does in the real world. And then the other fault that I see with these research that's often quite widely publicized is they'll take a five-way vaccine that might cover for five different things. And they really only test their innovative way for one of those components. It, it might be IBR, it might be BRSV. So you don't know what happens with the rest. So if you use it in an innovative way, you're not sure exactly what you're going to end up with. So it's very difficult to rely on expert opinions when they're doing things things that are really quite experimental rather than, rather than well documented. Um, and then you get into the practical questions for which there are no answers. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> so here's one. If I give a five-way viral and then I give manheimia and then I give the seven-way clostridial all on the same day because this is spring processing, do I overwhelm the calf's immune system? No idea. I've never seen any research to to say you do or you don't. Do pe people ask me, well, if you don't know for sure, do you think it's a good idea? Your expert opinion, in other words. And yeah, I think so, because I know if I send it out there without the clostridial in a black leg area or a red water area, it, that's got long, or it's got long day and short life written all over it, right? And so, so yeah, you know, the practical thing, you're gonna go, go ahead and do it, even if I told you not to, probably, because you would think, that he has been smoking something if he said not to do it. And so, so you're, you're going to go ahead. But nobody can answer that question. But this one, oops, two. This one I, I, I can answer or bring some insight to. And this one has come up in the, particularly in the last few years. If I give, if you, if I develop a vaccine and sell it, do I test the vaccine in total, or do I test the parts of the vaccine and then put it all together? So that, could it be that the vaccine would interfere with itself? But I worked in vaccine development uh, for a fair period of time down in the US, because it's all done in the US for cattle anyway. And so one of the things that we had to do is if we were going to test to see whether this vaccine protected against manheimia, then we had to use the, va the vaccine, so pyramid pre-spons, we'd have to use that. We couldn't just use the manheimia component and then assume that it wouldn't interfere with the rest. 
And so if it's designed to be administered in one syringe, if that's what the label says, you, it's all in one syringe, then they've already sort of investigated this. It hasn't provided any information for this because there's no clostridials that are designed to be given with a viral, for example. And so you can't answer that question. But if it's designed to be given in one syringe, this doesn't matter because during the product development, we would have had to demonstrate to the regulators that there was lack of interference. And I can remember doing research trials, giving little baby calves an 11-way vaccine, five virals, five lepso, and the Vibrio. Because by, if we were testing them to see whether the vaccine protected, we, were, we had to use the big damn deal vaccine. You weren't allowed to just use one part of the vaccine. So, so if it's designed to be administered in one syringe, if that's what the label says to do, then they will have already ruled out that it's going to interfere. Yes. So we all know Dr. Mix turned into vaccine, but sort of back to Granny though, and they came in and they were saying something about the vaccine. What gets people to affirm that they're going to get the vaccine? You mean mixing in the critter? Well, <laughs> Oh yeah, for for me, to, for me, it's a, it's an it's a, the, the rule of thumb is a hand width apart is sufficient. That's two separate sites. When it really gets into the biology, it all depends on the lymph node draining that particular region of the calf, right? If we we could get into that anatomy if you'd like, but uh, but from a practical standpoint, if it's a hand width apart, you're good to go. And I w I, I see it, and I I try to imagine how I would feel if somebody with an attitude was, was jamming a needle in up under my armpit. Yeah, you'd want to be carrying a hockey stick, I think, uh, <laughs> if, if it was me, uh, because I know the structures that are up there. So I'd much rather you give two on the side of the chest than give one up under the axilla, because, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, for, for for sure. So the buzzword, if it's if it if it comes if it's supposed to be given in one syringe, it's already been tested to show that it works just as well if it you give just one of them as give the whole darn bunch. So that's kind of good. So then briefly talk about practicalities. So it's wonderful to design a vaccination program and you've consulted with your veterinarian and you've bought the best darn vaccine you can buy and then you kill the vaccine before you give it to the animals. Yay, it works. Um, and uh, so there's some practical things about handling vaccines that I just, I'm honor bound. It's part of the veterinarian's contract, the oath that you say when you graduate, tell them how to use it properly. And so the modified life vaccines only work if they're alive. And so they start to die as soon as you mix them. And so the rule of thumb for me, an hour and a half is max. So if you mix them, you got to use them up within an hour, an hour and a half. They die faster if you expose them to heat and sunlight, which is why our vaccine bottles are amber, right? To try to cut that down, uh, for sure. And and that is that is the killer. So the rule of thumb for me is uh, is an hour to an to an hour and a half. Uh, the other thing is, yeah, I, yeah, we're in this. Um, keep them in a in a fridge or in a cold pack if you're not going to, going to use them. Uh, and I'm, I'm aware of what, uh, when we start, first started on-farm food safety in dairy way back in the late 90s, we, we required that dairy farms store drugs that were supposed to be, including vaccines, that were supposed to be refrigerated in a fridge. About a year into people going out and auditing dairy farms, we had to reword it to a functional fridge. <laughs> and and be, because the, the, old, the, old, the old maxim is you can never make anything idiot proof because idiots are so ingenious. And, uh, and so, so we, we had to go back and, and do that. And, and the min-max thermometers are so common now, I mean, Lots of them are given away that, you know, having one, I have it in my freezer because I got Alberta beef in that sucker. And uh, I, I, I want no errors. The only thing I don't have is an alarm that would send me a text to say to go out into the garage. And, but anyway, uh, so, so a thermometer is good for sure. If you're going to mix modified live uh, 
vaccines, because almost all of them contain viruses and almost all of the viruses are fragile, then you don't mix them by shaking them because you ru run the risk of, of destroying the, the viruses. And the more man mountain cannon you are in getting that cake, you know, let's get that thing dissolved, um, then the more likely you are to actually damage the vaccine that you just paid good money for. So the best way is to just roll it, roll it between your hands or roll it on your leg and, and dissolve it that way because that's the most gentle way to, uh, to, to the vaccine. Um, with killed vaccines, particularly with the clostridials, they settle so quickly that you have gotta keep mixing that bottle or you'll be, <laughs> the, the calves at the end will not get much, but the ones at the front or at the start of the process, they'll be uber protected. You know, there'd be, there'd be nothing going after them, right? They just run the other way. And so, so that, that is a problem. If you're using the multiple dose syringes, because now we're into an era that most vaccines that we give to cattle are only two mils, and it doesn't take much of an error to really short uh, animals when, it, when you're just giving them two mils. And when it was four mils, five mils, it didn't matter so much, but at two mils, it kind of is a problem. Um, if you give more than one vaccine, hand width apart, which is the recommendation here. Uh, don't, need, don't leave uh, needles in the bottles, no matter how photogenic that might be. You know, it, it just, just don't do that because you're likely to contaminate the vaccines and I really get worried about some of the kills going that way because people, people do it, I think, more with kills because they think, well, you can't be any deader than dead, so what, you know, what's the problem, right? And so, but you contaminate the vaccine or run the risk and using transfer needles for sure. Um, no vaccine should ever be frozen. And I've seen with, with cattle vaccines, I mean, accidents happen for sure, usually because the smallest dose with cattle vaccines is five, although you can buy one dose ones. Um, it, it, uh, it is not the same risk. With horses, they're all individual syringes, or a lot of them are. And you can freeze those guys by putting them on top of an ice pack that's at minus 18. So you take the ice pack out and put it in a little cooler and set the vaccine on the top of the ice pack and that'll often freeze the vaccine and you wouldn't you won't necessarily know that you've done that either so be a little bit cautious if you're dealing with small vaccine vials for sure um and then I, i'm i'm running a little campaign and veterinarians are probably going to shoot me but uh some calves some cows are at risk of anaphylaxis the same way that we are. When you get a vaccination at your physicians, they tell you you're gonna sit there for 20 minutes, bucko, until we tell you to go after you get vaccinated. With calves, it's worthwhile, it's very, very cheap to just have a bottle of epinephrine. If anybody's ever seen a calf with anaphylaxis and you give it, you give it uh, uh, epinephrine, you'll swear it's a miracle. And, but you know that, right? Because you probably know people who carry EpiPens. And epinephrine is, is transformational if you are developing ana, anaphylaxis. So it's worthwhile, worthwhile having it. Uh, for the visually impaired amongst us, <clears throat> usually age-related visual impairment, but just uh, uh, my colleague Tim Nichols said, yeah, you write the dose on a piece of white tape and tape it on the outside of the bottle so then you can get it there quickly and you know what it is. And that's, I think that's a good practical tip. Um, if you clean equipment, if you're going to use for inactivated warm soapy water and dish soap is just about right and then rinse it well. If you're going to use uh, uh, multiple dose syringes for modified lives, hot water only is good. If you've really been naughty and gotten it pretty darn uh, sort of stinky, uh, then dish soap again and then rinse it well, but never alcohol or any disinfectant like that because it could leave residues that are going to affect a uh, modified live vaccine. Um, so it's a balance. We're trying to do it what's easiest and protect the cows for sure. Um, and it's what you do, when you do it, and how you do it really that is, has the most influence on whether you're going to get the protection you want and, and whether you're going to get a good cost-effective value. Um, and then this one is a note particularly for people who are selling uh, replacements or selling bulls. I, I think that in Europe, it's required you pass that information along. I, I think it's not bad. This is this shows that your pride in your product as, mu as much as anything that you pass that information exactly what, exactly when, and they were vaccinated uh, because I remember sitting in the auction mart in Kamloops and this group of really nice looking calves wa walked in and somebody uh, 
uh, bidder said, you know, were they vaccinated? You know, the old universal gesture for vaccination. And uh, the, the auction mart, yeah, they were vaccinated. And he named a vaccine that I was sitting in my chair, I knew had not been sold on this continent in four years. <laughs> and, and since all vaccines have a two-year a two expiry on them, yeah, yeah, he must have made his own. And uh, anyway. But with that, uh, if you have any more, do I have time for questions, sir? Oh, okay. Uh, if there are any questions, please go away. That's one. Um, I had no idea it was so lucid. <laughs> but, ah, sorry. So a subcutaneous, uh, some guys will tent and some will use a short needle. Maybe what's your recommendation? Ah. Uh, <sighs> Boy, it's, I'm, I'm glad there's an election this fall. I can give a political answer to that question. Um, it, it really, it depends a little bit on what you're giving. If you're, if you're giving a, an antibiotic, then I, I think the tent's the, the way to go. Uh, because some antibiotics, if they're intended to go under the skin, they can be reasonably irritating if you give it in the muscle. And it, when you stand and you watch cattle, you notice how that, they have that wonderful gift that I don't have with, they can shake their skin to get a fly off. And, and uh, that is cutaneous trunk eye muscle. It'll be on the final, so you better know. And so you, you could, if you go, if you just jab it in without testing, you, tenting rather, you could get it into the cutaneous trunk eye. For, for most vaccines, it matters little. But there are some antibiotics where it, it does matter. So it just becomes a practical thing. I like the short needle. Uh, just make sure that it is, uh, is sharp. So sharp, short needle inst instead of dull. But either one works, works for me if you're giving a vaccine. I can't think of too many vaccines are, that are going to be grumpy if it gets in that, in that muscle. Uh, but there might be some drugs that do. Well, I was just going to ask which ones cause autism and which ones don't. <laughs> uh, crazy scientists cause, cause autism. Um, uh, the, the, the question, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I don't think it's changed. I don't think you can buy a vaccine for cattle that's got mercury in it. And the last time I checked, there was still one or two horse vaccines that had mercury in it. Would you even know that you had an autistic horse? Would be the question that that I I, I would ask, and and uh, so so it becomes somewhat of a moot point for for cattle vaccines. But you are a disturber, aren't you? Though <laughs> he's 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 agitating the pit and. Uh,